two years ago, there was a survey done by the American Psychological Association. And they found that in America, now listen to this, three out of five people, so there's five people in your row, three out of five people struggle with burnout. Staggering. In my family, there are seven. And I'm like, I don't think my kids look burnt out. But when I look in the mirror, I'm kind of a little well done, you know? <laughs> a little too burnt. Burnout. Some of you struggle to come to church this morning because you're struggling with weary stress. Burnout. 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 You might not have put your finger on this word, but now, as I say it to you, it, the dots are connecting and coming together, and you see the picture of burnout in your life. Three out of five Americans, burnout? And it made me wonder how many of us in the church believe Jesus died and rose again, and yet we're struggling with burnout. How many of us have experienced the supernatural move of God, the power of God, and yet are struggling with burnout? Burnout can be caused with various different things. And as I was looking at my own life, man, I could make like a list of 50 different things that causes me to feel burnout. <clears throat> Relationship stress, financial stretch, stress, health stresses, neighborhood stresses, political stresses, work stresses. Someone changed something that affects you and now you're burnt out. You're a boss and one of your employees just quit, burnout. The rent went up, burnout. All of a sudden, the roof, st roof starts to leak and you don't have money to fix it. Burnout. Some of you are dealing with personal pain. All of a sudden, someone died in your house. Emotionally, you're unable to pick yourself up, but you got to keep going to work and chugging along like nothing ever happened, and you're left with burnout. People who study minds say that when you're burnt out, you lack physical energy, depletion of energy, okay? So what do we do, drink a rock star? <laughs> no, I drink a rock star because I need to keep my mouth wet, otherwise my Indian accent kicks in. It's like I keep drowning the accent, that's all it is, okay? <laughs> physical depletion of energy. The next thing that happens is you're emotionally detached. You cannot emotionally be present when you're struggling with burnout. So physical depletion, emotional detachment, and then comes the mother of all burnouts. You feel like an absolute failure. Why? Because you cannot get your mind to be excited about the project you're on, excited about what God's doing in your life, excited about your family, excited about your church, excited about ministry, excited about the gospel. You cannot. And then physically you feel like, man, I want to do it, but I just can't leave my home right now. Thank God there's live streaming. I'll just live stream. You're weak. You're tired. And then the whole season of COVID did a number on us because we saw that it was just easy just to sit at home than to go out. We don't like socializing. And then that little, you know, anxiety you have of being around people just magnifies even more. Why am I sharing all of this with you? Because the enemy loves to play with this. The enemy will keep you in this place of burnout and slowly will begin to strip away at your identity. Strip you away from your calling. Strip you away from what God has entrusted and infused you with. And he'll make you just a shell of who you are. Today in this room, and those watching online, if I were to talk to the people closest to you, I know they will tell me this about those of you who are struggling with burnout, which is three out of five of you. They will say, a few years ago they were very different, and now this is just a shell of this person. I was looking at old pictures of myself, and I showed a picture to my wife. I said, I can't remember the last time I laughed like that. I was being an idiot in Hawaii. I said, I can't believe, and her grandma in the back of the picture is laughing at me. 
As I come to the the last time I was just such an idiot, just having fun. What happened? Stress. Burnout. Got to get serious with life. I'm getting older now. I got five kids. I got two dogs. I got one wife. I got one church. I got to get things serious. Burnout, burnout. And then you just become a shell of yourself, man. This morning, I believe God wants to restore your identity. Put out the fire of burnout. And help you to see that Jesus is still alive. No, this doesn't mean that you're not saved. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. I will share the gospel for those of you who need to receive Jesus as your savior. This doesn't mean you're not saved. Because even disciples do get burnt out. Let me say that again. Faithful disciples also can get burnt out. And this morning I want to talk to you who's struggling with personal burnout. I'm going to be in the book of John chapter 21. If you thought I'm just going to preach from a psychology book, you're false, it's wrong. I'm going to preach from the best book that was ever written. It's called, you might have heard of it. It's called the Bible. Okay. <clears throat> it's too bad it's not going to be King James, so I can't put some respect on it, but it'll be ESV. So I'm joking about that. John chapter 21, we're going to be from verse 1 to verse 14. And I'm going to ask the congregation to stand for the reading of God's word. And the reason why I ask you to stand when we read God's word is because I can give you my personal opinions, but my opinions mean nothing. All my opinions have to be held in the light of God's word. This morning, when we read God's word, I want you to let the Holy Spirit strengthen you. Some of you, you need to stand at the reading of God's word this morning because you've lost reverence for God's word and because of that you lost strength from God's word. How does God's word strengthen you as we even read it this morning? Because God's word is true and the truth will dispel the lies in your life that's tainting and changing your identity. So let's listen to God's word as we read it. We're going to be in John chapter 21 from verse 1 to 14. The scripture will be up on the screen for those of you that don't have a Bible. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, <clears throat> the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Oh, poor guys. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That Jesus whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garments, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came, into the uh, came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so were the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is God's word. And I'm titling this message, Blessings in My Burnout. Blessings in my burnout. If there are three out of five people who are burnt out, I believe in this church there are at least three out of five people who know Jesus to be God. And it's quite possible we're praying, Lord, bless my burnout. And this morning, I want to see God put the fire out that's burning and killing you and restore a fire in you that will reclaim the identity that he created you with. And for you to see the beautiful full nets of blessing, we're going to be talking about the failure, 
the fatigue, and the fullness. The failure, the fatigue, and the fullness. Failure, many of you can say amen to that, I know that. The fatigue, most of us can say, I'm there. But this morning, I don't want to just talk about the failure and the fatigue. We also have to talk about the fullness. Like I said earlier in the time of worship, there are some things that you have to learn to receive. And this morning, I hope God gives you the capacity of faith to receive the full nets that he has for you. If you will have the courage to throw the net on the other side. We'll unpack this, but let's pray first. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do. If it's in your will, O oh Lord, this morning to change our situation, please do it, Lord. But Father, if it's your will to change us in the situation that we are in, please, Lord, change us. Take us now from burnout to blessings as we receive from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Lord. I told you we're going to be talking about failure, fatigue, and the full nets. Failure. Let's look at this. Number one, identify failure. Identify your failure. You know, every single fail story, okay? Every single person who's talking about a time when they failed, you know how it starts? It starts off with, it was going so well. But then, hey, when I was cooking this food, it tasted so good. But then, I started the car this morning, it ran fine. But then, a marriage was doing great. But then, my children, oh my gosh, it was, our family was so full of fun. They were doing great. But then, now in your own life, you have those but then stories. It was going great, but then. Every single fail story in our life, every single area that's burning us out, started off with, it was going great. I mean, that's why it's a burnout. Because it was going great at one point. This was something that we enjoyed doing. This was something that we took pleasure in doing. Thank you. But then, now I want you to feel the weight of this, please. I really want you to feel the weight of this. All the joy when we're walking down the aisle. All our friends there cutting cake and celebrating first dance and pictures and everything like that. But then, oh, my son was doing so great. He was strong. He had such a great future. And then he went to college. But then something happened. You see, this is not just limited to you and me who have this but then times in our life. Peter was a disciple of Jesus, one of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus called Peter for everything. Every time Jesus went to do something, Peter was there. At the bound of transfiguration, Peter is there. And Peter runs his mouth, you know, here the prophets show up and he's like, let's build three circles over here for three of you guys. I don't mind, it's fine, I'll stay outside the tents, but we'll build three tents for you guys. And Peter, shut up, man. That's what Jesus says, like, that's your God, the Father himself speaks. So this is my son, you listen to him, Peter, you know. Peter's always running his mouth, uh, Jesus, that's you, tell me, I, I want to come out of the boat and walk on the water like you. I mean, Peter, you know, it's, it's a guy that... It depends on the mood that you're in. You either can't stand the guy or you just love this guy. You know, you probably love this guy from afar, but you probably wouldn't want to be Jesus, like leading this guy. Because it's like, bro, you're proactive, but I want to be proactive with your face and my knuckles right now, you know? It's like, stop! Peter, great guy. Jesus is telling his disciples, like, listen, man, one of you guys is going to betray me. And everybody's like, no, 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 not me, not me, not me. And then... Uh, Peter says, listen, all these guys, Jesus, they might betray you, but not me. I guess what he says in the book of John, all these guys, they might betray you, but not me. And then Jesus tells him, listen, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Ouch. And it did happen. In fact, Luke says that after, G after Peter denies Jesus, it says Jesus turned and looked at him. Ah. It was going well. 
I was walking on water with Jesus. It was going well. I carried the bread and the fish and fed the 5,000. It was going well. I saw the prophets, Jesus transfigured. It was going well. Every day I was with him. It was going well. Jesus was using my boat as a stage for him to get up and preach. It was going well. My boat was Jesus' personal Uber to take him all around Galilee. It was going well. But then, but then, all of a sudden, it changed. I denied him. And then he, he saw it. He looked at me. And then Jesus is crucified. And he's killed. Track with me. Peter runs to the tomb. Feel, feel what Peter is feeling. Best friend, God incarnate. So much so that Peter's willing to leave his business for three years. Hey, those of you businessmen, businesswomen, I dare you, leave your business for three years on hold and go serve Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's going to put a pit in your stomach. But, uh, can't do that. He left everything, followed him, and then he blows it by denying him. Jesus dies. He rises again, but this has not been addressed. And Peter's wondering, Jesus said at one point, Peter, you'll be a fisher of men. And Peter's wondering, have I blown it? Can I still work my calling even after I failed? Hey, can I, can I talk to some of you about a very real thing? God called you, but you've blown it. And you're sitting right here where Peter is. And you're saying, I don't know if I can keep pursuing my calling because I've blown it. If people knew who I really am, they would not call me to be a fisher of men. They would not want me to even hang around with their family. They would not want me to hang out with their children if they know what I've done, if they know my past, if they know what I've done. And Jesus turns and he looks at Peter and just like that, Jesus, you know Jesus looking at your heart and so you're sitting there hiding in shame and that stress and a failure is slowly playing tug of war with your life and it's pulling you into a place of burnout. What does Peter do? because he's struggling with his failure. Verse one in chapter 21 says, after this, Jesus revealed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, he's always mentioned first because he's a leader. Thomas called a twin, which is funny because Thomas is not even a fisherman, but he wasn't there when Jesus showed up the first time. He says, I'm not leaving your guys aside. Wherever you go, I'm gonna go. So funny, that's kind of like what I would do. <clears throat> and um, where are we, Thomas? Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two other disciples, doesn't matter who they are, but there were two others. They were there together, and Simon says to them, I am going fishing. Pause right there. Many language translators say that that is an absolute statement of saying, you know what? It's like, guys, I'm going fishing. It's like, hang all of that, I'm going to go fish. I cannot be bothered about I don't know what to do. My failure is so bad. I've fallen so far from grace. I'm just going to go fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. You see, let's get real. Sure, Peter served Jesus really well. If you read through the Gospels, man, Peter served Jesus really well. He put his business on hold. Whatever Jesus wanted him to do, he did it. Even though he, you know, talk backs a lot, he talks back a lot, he follows through. And Jesus has been patient with him. But look at this. Now he feels like, and I'm not assuming this, and I'll show you in scripture. He feels like there's no way Jesus is going to want me. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to go back to what I'm good at. I'm just going to go back to fishing. I know I put my business on hold for three years, but might as well go back to doing something that I'm good at. Instead of waiting for God to use me like he promised that he would. There is a stress to eat. And the disciples and Peter, he says, listen, Jesus died, rose again. And I goofed up big time. Might as well just get a good head start on my business and get my fishing business back. There's the stress to make some money. Jesus raised from the dead, great, but we still are going to have to eat. And so he's very confident in one thing, which is what? Fishing. He's got the tools. He's got the boat, he's got the net, and he says, we're going to go fishing. 
Ladies and gentlemen, later on in this chapter, Jesus is going to sit Peter down and he's going to ask Peter three questions, but it's going to be the same questions. He's going to say, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than the fish, more than the business, more than the disciples, more than what people assume of you? Do you love me more than these? And the reason why I'm confident that Peter says, listen, man, I'm, I've failed so far failed. I'm just going to go back to what I'm good at. It's because of the question that Jesus asked, and we'll be looking at that next week. And I wonder how many of you this morning are trying to work your way through burnout, just trying to just keep chugging along at what you're good at without first rectifying the failure in your life. Keep kicking the failures away, man. Maybe if I just move, the failure won't follow me. Maybe if I just jump from one relationship to the next, the failure won't follow me. Maybe if I just, you know, get a different job, the failure won't follow me. Maybe if I just, you know, I've been trying to do what God has blessed me with, but I'm, this is not really me. Maybe I just need to go do what is me, where my strengths shine the best. And you know what? The world will applaud you for that. The world will say, wow, what a dreamer. Way to go, man. Chase your dreams. But I'm here to tell you as a loving pastor, if you were to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I might not say this to you because I know this can really rip all your identity that you're standing on right now. But I need to tell you this. You might be chasing what you're good at, but you will find yourself in burnout if you don't deal with the failure first. What are the areas of stress that's making you walk away from what God has blessed you with? Now, like I said, I'm not saying you're not saved. Please listen to me loud and clear. You can be saved and still be harboring hidden sins. You can be saved and still be harboring hidden unforgiveness. You can still be saved and still harboring hidden hurts. You can still be saved and still not have love for your own family member. And you just try to move away, not talk, ignore those phone calls, ignore those text messages, ignore those birthday invites, and try to save up more money, try to be good at your job, but burnout will follow you. And I'm saying this because I love you. And I'm saying this from a place where I've had to walk this out. For more than 20 years, I ran away from reconciling with my dad. And I know the burnout that the enemy used against me. This week, I got to talk to one of the best people I can talk to on this earth. I spoke to my mom in my kitchen. You know what I spoke about? My personal burnouts. I mean, she stood longer than I could stand. I had to sit on and she was standing there and she listened to me. And I can tell you, as God is my witness, I wouldn't have been able to talk and pour my heart out and feel like I'd have someone who can pray for me if I didn't reconcile those broken relationships and just ignored them, push them under the carpet. I just say, you know what, I'm just going to go and young people, I want to talk to you real quick too. I'm sorry if I go off on rabbit trail this morning because this is very important. You can run after your own relationships, man. You find a girl that likes you and you can just ditch your whole family. If you don't reconcile broken relationships, burnout is calling your name and it will find you. Your families are so important. You might have someone who loves you and say, oh, you're my boo, I'll give you everything, but they don't have anything to give, man. They cannot be your dad and your mom and your sibling. If God's blessed you with a family, don't walk away from it. Reconcile those failures. In-laws, reconcile those failures. Neighbors, reconcile those failures. Broken relationships, fix it, man. Fix it. You see, Peter, he has a broken relationship with Jesus, and I can over-spiritualize this, man. Oh, it'll be great. Fix your relationship with God, which we'll get to. But, but, but look at the humanness. Peter, he has a breakup with his friend Jesus. And he's unable to trust the promises of Jesus, so he goes to what he thinks is best for him to do. Now, there are some relationships that you cannot fix because that person is dead. Hmm. But why are you letting a dead person still control your life? I want to talk to some of you who are old, who are still trying to prove yourself to your dead dad. See, dad? See, Dad, I can work hard. See, Dad, I'm talented. See, Dad, I can be loving. See, Dad, I can be faithful. Stop trying to prove yourself to a dead person. Reconcile that relationship with God and say, God, heal me from this. Stop living. Stop living in failure. If you don't identify your failure, 
if you don't identify that place of like, it was going well, but then, if you don't identify that, and you just praise the Lord, hallelujah, all your Christian words, hey, 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 you're a hypocrite. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you just to have beautiful Christian words. You got to fix this. You absolutely have to fix this. I'm not saying call the birds, be like, brother, I am so sorry. Stop that religious nonsense. Lord, Lord, change my heart. Lord, humble me, humble me, humble me. Please humble me. Stop making yourself the victim. Humble me, Lord. Please, Lord. Stop finding faults with people who've hurt you. Humble me, Lord. Identify the failure. Now, I'm sure there are other people who have hurt you, man. But you can't change people. Who can you change? You. You can take yourself to God. Be like, Lord, I see my failure, Lord. Number one, if you want to go from burnout to blessings, identify your failure. Are you with me this morning, church? Yes. Like I said, this doesn't have to be a sin issue. But it can very quickly turn into a sin issue. Because the enemy loves to use things in the darkness. The apostle Paul writes about expose the deeds of darkness to the light. It doesn't mean bring it to church and stand up and be like, I want to confess. No, no, expose it to the Lord. Lord, Lord, help me, Lord. Application for you. What are the areas of stress that's making you walk away from what God has blessed you with? What are those relationships that's broken, that's causing you to live in a pattern of stress that's bringing you to absolute breakout. You might be feeling like after this failure in my life, after this fallout, I cannot trust God. Yeah, there are some people like this, believers. I cannot trust God to come save me. I cannot trust God to still love me. My sin is too great. I'm going to go fishing. And if that's you this morning, identify the failure, man, and don't go fishing. Whatever that fishing looks like for you. Don't go chasing after the next thing. Don't go chasing after your own ideas and agendas. Take it to God. If you want to see blessings come from your burnout, you have to identify the failure. Did you get that? Yes. Very good. If you got that, then we move to number two. Number two. We spoke about, I told you I'll be talking about fatigue. Number two. Do not push through your fatigue. Don't push through your fatigue. Okay, okay, okay. Prophetic stuff coming through. Get ready to receive. Pastor, you're young. You don't know what you're talking about. I've been doing this for 40 years, Pastor. I know we all go through hurts. We all have brokenness in our homes. We all have brokenness. Not everybody can be like you. I've been pressing through and pushing through and I've been fighting and working in my own strength for 40 years, Pastor. I just got to keep chugging along and doing it. Don't. Don't. I love you. I respect you. I'm sure you have way more life experience than I do. But I know that God's word is true and God's word says stop pushing through your... Another word for fatigue is burnout. Stop just trying to chug along through burnout. What you need is not more energy drinks. More nutrition pills, more healthier diet. Maybe you guys need that. Good for you, but that's not going to bring you out of burnout. How many of you guys, man, have spent so much money? Your, your medicine cabinet is full of tried and failed medications, thinking that it will increase your mood, make you happier, make you stronger, bring you out of your burnout. Stop pushing through your burnout. What would you rather have? God's calling on your life or your efforts that's trying to keep you in hidden failure. And once again, I want, I, want, I want to warn you, church, because the world, people who don't see your life through God's word, they will applaud you, man. They will be like, dude, good for you, man. He's always trying. You know, the, again, sorry, I'm not picking on young people, okay, but you guys need to stop being such dumbasses. I'm talking to young people so I can use that language. They get it. One day you're a photographer on Instagram. Next day you're a web builder, web designer. Next day you're a social media expert. Stop that nonsense, man. You can't just keep pushing through one thing after another and not identify and confront and admit that you have burnout. See, you don't have to be 50 years old with five kids for you to have burnout. You can be 13 years old and struggling with burnout. I love you. That's why I'm saying this to you. Because no one's going to respect you when you have 15 different 
things that you go through in three months. It tells me that you do not know who you are. And you're trying to grasp at something instead of identifying the failures in your life. Yeah. Now the worst part is some of you, you're 50 years old and you're still doing the same thing. Peter, come back to Peter. Verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Fantastic. Fantastic. Preston, let's put that on a t-shirt, bro. I'm going fishing. <laughs> I have gone fishing and I hate it. <laughs> I catch the ground like Adelaide says. Moss, rocks. I'm done, man. One day I bought all the fishing license for me and my wife, and my kids and everything of like that. Caught nothing. We went to Costco. I looked at how much I paid for my fishing license. I'm looking at the price of fish. I'm like, I'm not going fishing again. I'm going to Costco instead. You know? Costco, you better pay me royalties for mentioning your name. But Peter says, I'm going fishing because Peter has experience in this. Nobody said, Peter, you're an idiot. You've never been fishing. What are you going to do? Go fishing. It's like Joel wanting to be a pastor. Have you seen him? Get a haircut, bro, if you want to be a pastor. You know? That's not the way with Peter. Peter has the tools, man. Peter's got the boat, he's got the net, he's got the lingo, he's got the business contact deals, even though it was three years old. He knows this thing, he could do it in his sleep. I'm going to go fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. He just doesn't have, look at this, look at this, look at this. He just doesn't have the tools. He also has such a personal confidence in his business, in his field of expertise, that even his friends are like, dude, we'll come with you. I mean, I don't want to get in the car. When I was a youth pastor, when youth would get their driver's license, be like, I want to take you for a drive. I'm like, yeah, no, thank you. You know, I mean, I don't mind seeing Jesus, but I don't want to live as a vegetable for the rest of my life, you know? And I know you don't go fast enough to kill me. You just go fast enough just to hurt me really bad. <laughs> but Peter's not like that. I'm going fishing. They're like, dude, we'll come with you. That even Thomas, who's not a fisherman, is like, dude, I'll come too. He has the tools. He has the experience. He has the means. But does that bring the result? <laughs> no. It's kind of crazy. You can have the best camera. You can have the best building. You can have the best suit. You can have, I don't know what it is in your life, man. You can have all the best things, but that doesn't mean it's going to bring the result. Because they said, we'll go with you. And then they went out and they got into the boat. But that night, they caught... Uh, they caught... Feel that. Feel the weight of that. Please, feel the weight of that. Here is Peter, the fisherman. Which one has a better ring? Peter, disciple of Jesus, or Peter, the fisherman? Ah, oh, Peter, the fisherman, of course. He acts like, that makes sense. He acts like a fisherman. He's strong, he's crazy, he talks a lot, probably very loud. I'm going fishing, we'll come with you. I got the tools, I got the means, I got the expertise, I know what to do, I know where to go, I know the best places to fish. And they fished all night and caught nothing. Oh my gosh. Ah, sorry, Peter, I, I don't know, man. This is kind of awkward, bro. You're, you're the master of fishing, but not one catch. Wow. Church, I got to ask you the question. Are you in a place of failure trying to find the one thing you're good at so you can find a little bit of satisfaction? And then maybe you found the one thing that you think you're good at, but you're failing and you're failing and you're failing and you're failing and now you're depressed and now you're burnt out. I, th I thought I was good at that. I thought I had it in the bag. I mean, I failed, I sinned. I couldn't get back to my calling, but I thought I could at least get back to my job. But even in my job, I suck. All night, nothing. I got the good tools, I got the best tools, but nothing. And I wonder how many of you are going from one net to the next net to the next thing to the next thing trying to find something you're good at so you can find some satisfaction something something i think one of the reasons why our social media explodes if there's any new social media app it explodes you know why i think i know why i think it's because everybody's looking for an answer 
I think the whole world is looking for an answer on TikTok, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on this and that. Everybody's looking for an answer. But we don't realize that the whole world has questions, but nobody has the answers. There's only one that has the answer. His name is Jesus. And so you can throw your net everywhere. I'll go here. I'll go to this church. I'll go to that church. I'll listen to Reformed preachers, Baptist preachers, Pentecostal preachers, preachers in Tennessee, preachers in Chicago, preachers over here, preachers in Boise. Um, yeah, the best they got is good questions. But the only person who has the answers is Jesus. And here's Peter, man, ignoring his failure. Tries to chase after something that he's good at, and he's working through the fatigue. How long is he fishing? All night long. And some of you, you've been fishing all your life. All your life. Again, I'm not saying you're not a believer, man. But Jesus did die on the cross and rise again from the dead for you to hide burnout. But he died so that you can have life and life in abundance. The problem is not the one thing you're good at. The problem is the stress that's leading you to burnout that came from not being right with your failure. Now, many times, this can also mean you're not being right with God. There are seasons in life that you will go through burnout. Believers, we will go through burnout. We will go through stress. I go through burnout a lot. There are days when I cannot move, get out of my bed. <clears throat> Preaching like this takes energy. Do you know that? It takes so much of spiritual, emotional, physical energy, mental energy. If you see me at home, my primary preoccupation, it's seriously, some, my ears are fixed to heaven. I'm not trying to be over dramatically spiritual over here. Because if I want to preach the word of God, I shake, man. I'm like, okay, I better give God's word to you. And there are times when I want to preach what's convenient for me, but God's been challenging me and say, don't preach what's good for you, preach what the church needs. And I'm preaching this message because the church needs to hear this. And your burnout, my burnout, doesn't necessarily have to be sin, but many times when burnout becomes your identity, it's rooted in sin because you've not taken your failures to God. You've not taken your stresses to God. You've taken your stress to TikTok. You've taken your answers from social media, from books. You've not taken your answers from God. I know for me, I struggle a lot in this country because I don't look like you guys. And oftentimes the enemy uses lies to say they don't respect you because of your color. They don't want to come to your church because of the way you look. What are you doing in Idaho? I've, church, I'm, I don't hide about this. You know this. I talk to you when I struggle with suicidal thoughts. I talk to you when I struggle with my own deep depression. My neighbors called the cops on me this week because my car was parked in my cul-de-sac. They didn't have the... Come knock on my door? Hey, bro, can you move your car? Absolutely, man. So I'm in a meeting and my kids call me and say, there's a cop at the door. My heart starts racing because this is not the first time this neighbor has done it. Third time. And so the enemy will say, leave Idaho. I'm feeling weak to even stand and tell you this right now, but I'm being open with you because I want you to understand I'm speaking from a place where I have to fight this battle every day. But I don't want to give any foothold to the enemy because if I do, I'll be packing my bags and I'll be leaving and finding, throwing a net somewhere else, hoping to find some place where I can catch fish. But you know what will happen? I can move to Hawaii. I can move to California where people look more like me. I can move back to India, but I will catch nothing. And I know that there are some of you who are trying to find your place where you can fit in, where you're good at, where you feel like, finally, I'm home. This world is not your home. Yes, you will struggle with burnout. Yes, you will have people who hate you. Yes, you will have cops who pull me over and say, Sir, do you have any bombs in your car? Because I look like a terrorist. <laughs> but if I don't take that to God, you see, it's not a sin issue, but if I don't take it to God, it quickly becomes sin because now I'm like Jonah running the other way. I struggle, man. I want to throw my net all night somewhere else. Sometimes I feel like even the satisfaction of just throwing my net will be enough. In my heart, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't mind trying risky things. Some of you, you're living that way. 
you're happy with the motion of throwing the net all night. At least you're doing something. At least you're busy. It's like sitting on a rocking chair, right? It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. And this is your whole life. And you surround yourself with friends who are like, wow, wow, wow. Hate that when people say that in church. Wow. Without anything being wow. And there are people who say that in your life. Wow, good job, man. One thing to the next. Wow, one thing to the next. Wow, one thing to the next. Nonsense. I see through that because of God's word. It's because you've not identified failure. It's because you've not taken to God. And quickly, it's going to take you away from where God wants you to be. You see, in 1 Kings chapter 18, there's a man named Elijah. You heard of him? Yes. Great guy. Had coffee with him yesterday. I'm kidding. I didn't. <clears throat> we drank a rock star instead. <laughs> no, we just sat around and had, you know, a bonfire. LOL. Because Elijah, that's what he did. No, I didn't have coffee with him or a bonfire with him. I'm just joking. First Kings 18, Elijah calls all the prophets of Baal. And he says, let's have a competition. You worship your God and call on fire from heaven. Let it burn the evening sacrifice. And if it happens, we'll worship Baal. I'll set up an altar and I'll call on Yahweh, the true and the living God. And if he sends fire down, Yahweh will be God. If you've grown up in church and watched Veggie Tales, you know what happens. Fire comes down, burns up Elijah's offering, even though it's dozed with water, burns it up. It says it licked up everything. Even the stones were burnt up. And then Elijah gets up. 450 prophets are slaughtered, killed. They kill all the prophets of Baal. And after three years of rain, Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, tomorrow by this time you'll be dead. I'm going to make it my personal responsibility, Elijah, that tomorrow by this time, just like how you killed the prophets, I'm going to kill you. Here's a prophet called on fire from heaven, stood there with courage, mocked these prophets, killed these guys, stood up for the true and the living God, one message from Jezebel. Do you remember what he does? He runs. He runs from the top of the map all the way to the bottom of the map. He goes into depression. He says, there's no point in me living. I am no good. But God shows up in the form of an angel. And the angel gives him food. And says, eat. And he ate and he slept. And he ate and he slept. And I can stand here and say, if you're struggling with burnout, what you need is rest. What you need with burnout is Get a good meal and take a nap. But what do you do when your burnout is coming from hidden sin? Elijah, great. I know most of our burnout is not because we just slaughtered 450 false prophets and called on fire from heaven. Hey, if you're burnt out because you called on fire from heaven and just killed 450 prophets, by all means, eat angel food cake, go to bed. Okay? But most of our burnout is not because of that. Most of our burnout is because our failures have turned into fatal sins that we've not admitted and confessed before God. Instead, we find ourselves throwing our nets one place to the next, trying to find something that we can be good at so we can cover up our failures. What do you do when you're fatigued, battling failure, burnout because of hidden sin? And it shows itself as a failure that's leading to fatigue and burnout. You see, instead of finding what you're good at, first, get right with God. This morning, I want to invite you Instead of trying to find the next thing you're good at, instead of me suggesting another book, Strength Finder, find out what your calling is and all that nonsense, get right with God. Admit, Lord, I failed. Lord, I goofed up, Lord. And to hide this failure, to not rectify this failure, I've been trying to do this, all these other things and just being busy. If God is not showing you any sin in your life this morning, praise God, man. Then this message it's for you to have this as a resource for those who are burnt out, okay? Because three out of five people are burnt out, so I know that there's at least three of you among five of you who are burnt out. In the boat, there are seven people, but this, this message was for Peter, one guy. So even among seven, if it's one person, praise the Lord. That one person, if God is showing you hidden sin in your life, admit come clean. It could have been just very simple. One unforgiveness. One little snarky remark that grew into this crazy denial of God's love for another person in your family or in your life. 
If God is showing you, praise God, admit it. Number three, number three. You see, when you listen and obey, when you, when you turn to God, admit, Lord, I admit, I've been working all night long, catching nothing all my life. I've been trying to cover up my failure. When you admit, it's got to be followed with, okay, Lord, I'm ready to listen now and I'm ready to obey. Number three, the immediate healing in the full net. This part of this message, I believe God wants to do something very supernatural in your life. Because healing doesn't come by my words. Healing comes when his nail scarred hands begins to invade the brokenness of your life. And I want you to do, what I want you to do as we go through these next few verses is, I want you to reach out and touch the hem of his garment, so to speak. I want you to say, Lord, heal me. I want you to get real with the areas of your failure, get real with the areas of your fatigue where you're throwing out the net and say, Lord, heal me from my burnout. Because hey, listen, you need to participate in this if you want to go from burnout to blessing. You reach out, touch the hem of his garment, and everything that God begins to speak, begin to apply it even right now in your life. The only way that God is gonna be able to come and turn our burnout into blessing is if we're willing to admit to our failures. And then if we're willing to listen and obey, healing is not going to come by, by your situation changing around you. Please get this. Oftentimes God doesn't change your situation around you, but he wants to change you. He wants to change your heart. He wants to give you this morning when I'm driving over here too. My wife was talking about just our drive because I was getting frustrated. Slow drivers. I got a loud horn and I want to use it. And she said, wow, man, this is... She said, this is so peaceful just driving over here, not how to drive on the freeway and, you know, stop lights. I was like, wow, perspective. And that's what God does when he heals you from your burnout to bring you the blessing is he changes you. So receive that healing. Verse 4. Just as day was breaking. Wow, all night long. They're tired. They're fatigued. They're burnt out. Just as day is breaking. They've been at it all night long. Jesus stood on the shore. Praise the Lord. He doesn't leave you in your fatigue, burnt out state. Jesus stood on the shore. He's not walking on the water. Hey, get this. You want Jesus to come walking on the water? No, he's standing on the shore. Why? Because these guys are out on the, on the, on the water where they shouldn't be. They should have been waiting for him. And so they're going chasing after their dreams. And, but Jesus doesn't leave you there. He's standing on the shore. And yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. There were a lot of things the disciples did not know. They did not know where to fish. They did not know how to fish, even though they thought they did. They did not know how long they had to keep fishing to catch one fish. One fish, nothing. All night long. And now Jesus is standing and they don't know that it was Jesus. Please, please, this morning church, know that Jesus is standing on the shore and admit, please admit that you don't know. Lord, I'm burnt out, Lord. I'm tired and I don't know. I've been trying the best I can, but I don't know. Because when we admit, Jesus is able to heal you. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, that word children is not like, a, oh, my little child, my loving children. That's not what he's saying. This is like, hey, fellows. Hey, guys. Yo, homie. Children, do you have any fish? That question is not Jesus asking because he doesn't know. In fact, the way this question is phrased is, He's saying, you don't have any fish, do you? <laughs> One boat over there. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Hey guys, you got no fish, do you? This morning Jesus is asking you, hey church, you got no strength, do you? Hey church, you cannot keep running on fumes anymore, can you? Hey, you, you're tired, aren't you? Hey you, you're feeling stupid right now, don't you? Hey you, you do not know what to do next, isn't it? And the only thing you can do is what? Admit. Hey, you have no fish, do you? No. 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 And I know admitting takes humility to say, I don't know, man. I don't know what I'm doing. It, oh, it takes a lot of humility for the fisherman, Peter, to say, no fish, fished all night. It almost seems 
I mean, uh, did he whisper no? Did Jesus ask it like 15 times because they were just ignoring him and they were like, no man, no, we have no fish, okay? And then what happens next is kind of crazy, but they admitted, no, we have no fish. And then he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Come on, stop. Oh gosh, this is very frustrating. You know, when um, you have a good at something that you do, let, let's say, man, you, you're good at grilling and you have this recipe that works all the time. You're just so confident in it and you invite someone from church to your home for a meal and they tell you how to grill. You'll be like, bro, your face will be on the grill. <laughs> oh, 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 I'll make it personal. When someone comes to my home, eats my Indian food and tells me how to cook Indian food. I know Gandhi won the independence without shooting a bullet, but this is Idaho, buddy. <laughs> Say that again. You know? <laughs> Here's a stranger on the shore saying, hey, throw it in on the other side, you'll catch some fish. Mm, uh, how about I be beat you with the oar, man? Like, stop. But listen, oftentimes we don't want to admit that we're failing. And it's easier for you to keep living in the rut of burnout because misery loves company and if there are three out of five people are burnt out guess what baby you're the majority so you're the normal ones the ones who are stronger are the abnormal ones wait a minute that's exactly how america functions <laughs> if you got a mental illness you're normal if you're normal you're weird i'm not bashing on anybody but i'm stating the truth admit and then Humble yourself. God is speaking to you through his word. And he says, cast your net on the other side. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. This morning, I believe God's calling you to respond like you've never responded before. In a way that you've not responded before. With faith, knowing that he's going to come through. When you admit, Lord, I can't keep doing this anymore. Lord, thank you that you're speaking to me today. I'm ready to take that step. I'm willing to humble myself and do what you're calling me to do. I'm not saying give Jesus a six-week trial. No. I'm asking, him to give, I'm asking you to give him your life, knowing that he will come through. And so, they threw it. Now, I don't know if their attitude is what I'm asking you to do. They might have done it just to prove the stranger wrong, as if they're not thrown on the right side of the boat. They threw it. And then... Look at the blessing. They were not able to haul it in because the quantity of fish, how many guys are there in the boat? Seven, in case you forgot. Including Peter, macho man. They're unable to bring it in, it's so heavy. Here, Peter has been fishing all night. The fisherman has all the tools, has all the experience, but one word from Jesus can change everything. Let me say it again, church. One word from your Savior can change everything. Man, I wish we had a church that knew how to stand on their feet and worship when God speaks to you. One word that comes from His throne room of grace can change everything. Now, it doesn't mean your circumstance around you can change, but it can change you. And you have been working your muscles off. You've been working yourself so tired and weary and burnt out. One word. If you're willing to admit, I have none, believe. And then you receive. They're unable to bring it in. Praise the Lord. God is able to bless even your burnout. I'm so glad that Jesus, see, 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 as a pastor, this is hard for me to even comprehend. I don't even know how to preach this. Because Jesus doesn't say, you shouldn't be doing that. Shame on you. You already denied me once, and now you deny me with your works. Get your butt back to the shore, Peter, now. I got a butt butt spoon waiting for you. As a pastor, that's what I'd want to do. But he doesn't do that. God blesses you in your burnout, man. He says, hey, listen, listen. If you're willing to admit and believe, I will bless you where you are. And I'm going to show you that I'm bigger than your blessing. Some of you, what God's calling you to do is so great, but you don't realize if you're willing to let go, man, of your own ideas, your own wisdom. He's going to fill your nets. He's going to fill your nets. I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, but I cannot not 
preach what God has been doing in my own life. If you're willing to admit, believe, and then your belief turns into action, he's able to fill your nets. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, we'll go through this fast, look at this. It is the Lord, that's John, the apostle. It's the Lord, there's only one person who's able to do this. There's only one person, Elon Musk cannot do this. The president cannot do this. All the intellectual people who talk on TikTok cannot do this. There's only one who can speak a word and change the whole night around. Who can take me from burnout to blessing. There's only one. It is the Lord. And Peter, he believes it. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garments for he was... Okay, it's a little PG. He was stripped for work and he threw himself in the sea. He was wearing Speedos. Let's make it a little bit more normal. Okay, I wanted to go through this fast, but I cannot help it, okay? Okay. What would make you swim faster? A jacket, a robe, or Speedos? <laughs> Peter, you're a fisherman, man! It's Jesus! <laughs> and moreover, what would be faster, the boat or swimming? They're only 100 yards away. Now, I've tried to once outswim a boat in India. I'm not a great swimmer, but man, there's no way the best swimmer can outswim a boat. Or maybe they can, I don't know. But with a robe on, after fishing all night, in burnout, maybe not. But I think there's a lesson for you and me. I think there's a lesson for you and me. Peter grabs his cloak, and I didn't get this until this morning. I preached this message before about how your robes represent your identity. Joseph, his father gave him a robe of many colors. After Joseph was allegedly killed by wild animals, they stripped him of his robes, they put blood on it, and they took it to Yaakov's father, Jacob. And they said, identify, is this your son? Robes represent identity. When Yeshua, when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, they were waving palm branches and they were laying their robes. King Herod, in the book of Acts, put on his kingly robes and took the praises of the people and the angel whacked him and killed him. Robes represent identity. Jesus was put when he was being beaten in a purple robe because robes represent identity. What does Peter do when he's leaving the boat? What does Peter do when he's leaving the boat? What does Peter do when he's leaving the boat? I want you to get this church as we bring this to an end. This is important. He grabs his robe and he jumps into the water. He's not leaving his identity in failure. He's not leaving his identity in fatigue. He's not leaving his identity in burnout. He's taking his identity and he's going where? To Jesus, he's leaving the fish, he's leaving the business, he's leaving his tools, he's leaving his expertise, and he's going to Jesus. And I want to invite those of you who are struggling with burnout to grab what the enemy has been stealing from you, the identity, and make your way to Jesus. You got to grab it, jump in. It's okay if some crazy pastor 2,000 years ago later will preach about you and make fun of you. It's okay. Let the fish go, let the boat go, let the friends go, let the disciples go, let the sea go, let the Sea of Galilee go. I am going to Jesus, grab your identity and run. This morning, this is urgent. you got to grab your identity and run. No more sitting in burnout. No more sitting and trying to cover up your failure. No more sitting in failed, fatigued fishing. I'm running after Jesus, are you? Yes. Verse 8, the other disciples came in the boat. Praise the Lord, not everybody jumped in though. Some people got to get the work done. And they were dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from land. Peter, you shouldn't have jumped. We're not far from land. Come on, man. But now you know why Peter jumped. And they were about 100 yards off. But the real blessing was not the fish. The real blessing was not the fish at all. <laughs> See, some of you, you're waiting for stuff. You're waiting for your circumstance to change. The real blessing is right here. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Sorry, verse 9. When they got out on the land... They saw a charcoal fire in place. Pause, pause, pause. They saw what? Charcoal fire. When was the last time we saw a charcoal fire in the book of John? Do you remember? When Peter is standing, warming himself by a charcoal fire and a 
high school girl says, aren't you one of his disciples? Smells have a way of taking you back. I'm so glad that Jesus just doesn't heal you from your hidden sins, from your emotional sins. Man, he heals you in every way, man. If you go to the book of John, you see these things sticking out and you see what a beautiful savior he is. Like we sang, amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free. God, my savior, he ransomed me. I was there by the charcoal fire when he turned and he saw me. That made me run to go fishing all night in my fatigued failure. But now there's a charcoal fire and he's not here to tear me down. Instead, he's doing what he came to do. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. They saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter, look at this, big man Peter, went and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. All of them couldn't bring it to, to the shore. He goes all alone. That's supernatural strength. Her brings it, but check this out. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. So many applications in this if you're listening. Some of you are scared of what God is calling you to because you think you cannot handle it. Let me get real with you as I bring this to a close. You see this building around us? We were meeting with the agent who rents this building out. And I couldn't move the next day. I had to be in God's presence. I'm like, Lord, help me. My net is full, but I'm worried my net's going to break. I know that soon God's going to fill this church, but I'm worried that my net's going to break. Some of you, God's calling you to great things, but your fear is keeping you from actually pursuing it because you're scared the net is going to break. You don't know how you're going to maintain your family. God, thank you for blessing me with the family, but I'm worried my net's going to break. God, thank you for blessing me with a home, but I'm worried my net's going to break. God, thank you for blessing me with children, but I, I don't know, Lord. I feel like my net's going to break. Listen, God has already factored in your failures. God's already factored in the wear and tear of the net when he put 153 fish in there. And moreover, God knows how much your net can hold. God knows. God knows your PSI, how much pressure you can handle. And sometimes God will put you through the pressure and it feels like burnout. But pressure is what brings out the oil. Pressure is what turns grapes to wine. When you press it, when you squeeze it. Some of you, God's going to call you to great things. He has been calling you. But you are ignoring it. And you're scared or you're throwing your net because you wonder if your net's going to break. This morning, I want you to trust God. Trust God. Say, Lord, I'm ready. Fill my nets, Lord, I'm ready. Don't be arrogant about it. Still be in awe that it's God who fills the net. But that's the miracle right there, man. The miracle of the fish is great. But you know what? To me right now, the miracle of the net not being torn speaks so much to me. Because there are things that God's calling me to do and I feel very torn. There are things that God's calling me to and I don't think I have the healing yet for it. And God says, I will keep your net. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Wow. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. All right. All right. So, as we close, God wants to take us from burnout to blessing. Even as you leave these doors, God wants you to have the strength to haul the full net. What do you got to do? Admit. Stop trying to figure out your failures. God's already showed it to you. You know. I don't need to sit and preach on sexual purity. I don't need to preach about protecting your mind. You know there's areas of sin in your life. Admit, Lord, I failed. Believe, 
believe. Stop trying to push through your fatigue and burnout. Believe. Stop throwing the net. Believe. Believe his word. He's able to change you. This morning I said, stop standing on your work, stand on the grace. Believe. Believe. And come and fellowship with Jesus. Come fellowship with him. Grow in intimacy with him. Make it a priority today. Every time you're tempted to go throw your net out into the world, whatever that looks like for you, instead of doing that, come fellowship with him. Come sit with him. Start your day with him. Fill your day with him. Every time the world is pulling you to go into your religious schedule and just do your thing that you're good at, stop. Stop. So, Lord, I want, I want to commune with you. And then when he fills your net, don't let the enemy fill your hearts with fear. Trust that he will protect your net. Husbands, when you go home, oh, pull that net with joy, knowing that he will take care of the net. Wives, take care of your children well. Serve your husbands well. Pull that net with joy and gladness, rejoicing at what God is blessing you with. Let God open your eyes to see the full net. Do it with joy, knowing that he has forgiven you, knowing that he's called you faithful. All the failures of tomorrow, don't let that stress you out about pulling the net today. Hey, some of you, all of you are stressing about next week. You're stressing about your paycheck. You're stressing about this day that's coming to an end. I need to move at this time. Stop stressing. Pull the net today. He'll take care of the rest and come fellowship with Jesus. Whatever God's put you in, pull it with joy. Pull it with joy. Pull it knowing that he will come through. He will keep the net from breaking. God will take you from burnout to blessing. Would you please stand? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray for one thing tonight, this morning. I'm going to pray for one thing this morning. I want to pray for those of you who need to jump out of the boat, grab your cloak, and go to Jesus. I'm talking about those of you who might have been believers, but you've let the enemy use shame, failure to steal from you. And this morning, we're going to take back what the enemy has stolen. Yes. We're going to places that you never thought you could go. I'm going to take back what the enemy has stolen. Yes. He's taken your peace. He's taken your confidence. He's taken your identity. He's taken your chutzpah, the courage that you had once to walk with the Lord knowing that he will come through. He's taken away your faith. He's taken away your joy. And he's replaced all of those things with intimidation and fear. And I'm going to pray for this one thing. And I want those of you who need to grab your cloak and come to Jesus. I want you to do that this morning. Now, this is not an altar call of like, you know, give your life to Jesus. This is you saying, man, I walk with Jesus. I know Jesus, but the enemy has been playing havoc in my life. And like Peter, I want you to forsake everything else. I want you to forsake you trying to prove yourself to the world. You trying to prove yourself to be a righteous man, a good man, a whatever man or woman. And for you to come in fellowship with Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, for those that need this, oh Lord, this morning. And by the way, guys, I'm standing with you. I need to grab my cloak and come to Jesus this morning. There are so many things that strip me away. Good things, not necessarily bad things. Fishing is not a sin. But when it takes me away from actually trusting Jesus. Father, please, Lord, sift us. Sift us well this morning, O oh Lord. From the youngest to the oldest this morning, sift us well. From the simple things that don't seem harmful to the great things that have to be hidden for personal shame, sift us, O oh Lord, this morning. You are God. You are God who died and rose again, you are God. Thank you that you're not only El Shaddai, but you're also a God who's our friend, who knows our weaknesses, who's willing to sit and dine with us. Restore identity, Lord, this morning. Oh, we need it. Restore identity. Protect this church, O oh Lord. Protect it from the false identity that the world would want to put on us. Help us, O oh Lord, to stop flirting with the world. 
forgive us for trying to impress the world and our friends with our fishing skills. Let's just swim to you. Let the statistics of burnout be proven false in this church as you bring us out of our burnout into our blessing. I pray for those of us who struggle with unneeded conflict, O oh Lord. Give us humility. Let our words be seasoned with salt. Teach us to do good to those who hate us. I pray for those of us who are struggling with finances that's causing us burnout. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Help us to seek you, knowing that all these things will be added to us. For those of us who are struggling with behavioral patterns that have taken over our life that's causing us burnout, now give us strength, O oh Lord, to grab our cloak and swim to you. For those of us who have demands placed on us, and we don't have the sufficient energy to fulfill those demands. Come and be our strength. Help us, O Lord, for, to stop waiting for the inevitable burnout, but to wait for the blessing of our nets being full. And I pray this in faith. I pray this in faith. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit fill your nets supplement in every area where you have need. Let the supernatural work of God begin in your life even right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.